I want to share with you uh, out of 1 Peter chapter 1, 13, and we're going to look uh, to, to verse 16. This is a portion of scripture that quite honestly, uh, to me, culminates really the heartbeat of what the gospel is, is, is all about. If you look at this, it says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, this little portion of scripture, it is linked to the, of course, the beginning of, of this letter that uh, Peter wrote, uh, Peter being one of the key apostles, the guy who saw all these things up close personal, the man who uh, uh, was willing to step out and wanted to do something miraculous, the man who was willing to step out and walk on water, uh, and it wasn't the Atchafalaya Basin. I mean, you, you can almost do that. <laughs> but, but the man who, who uh, stuck his foot in his mouth, the man who... Uh, wimped out, the man who denied Christ, but then the man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and had the opportunity to really preach the very first sermon and see 3,000 people come in. I like this guy. There's something about him, okay? There's just something about him. Well, just prior to this, he's talking about the incredible salvation that we have been afforded. And we live in a time frame, and the, and the people in his hearing lived in a time frame that everyone else in previous history only longed for, the salvation of our souls. The fact that the Lamb of God, who was pure, sinless, chose to lay down his life for the forgiveness of our sins, and that you and I, by simply confessing our sin, can have our sins washed away. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to bring a goat here today. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we, we don't have to sacrifice every year. But man, we have the opportunity to have our souls and our spirits clean before the Lord and stand before him right and new. Born again, an imperishable seed. This is what he's talking about. But he says, you know what? As a result of that, then there's a couple of things you need to do. You need to prepare your mind for action. You need to know that your mind, there's a battle going on for your soul and it's coming through your mind. Now, let me just say this. I, I love to think, I love to read, I love to be challenged intellectually. I really do. I'm not the sharpest cookie. Or You see, I, I can't even get the pencil thing right. But, um, uh, you know, I'm not the, the, the brightest pencil in the bulb. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Um, so... But, but I love, I love thinking. I love uh, thinking about and studying theology. I love all of that stuff. I really do. But I just want to lift my hands for a second and praise the Lord that it's not based on our intellectual ability, whether or not we come to faith. And that's not what he's talking about. It has nothing to do with our intellectual ability. See, I didn't have to figure out what the atonement was before I accepted Christ. I didn't have to not understand all the Old Testament sacrifices, how that led up to what Jesus did. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know any of that, but I did know that there was something drawing me. There was something pulling me. There was something that brought me to faith. There was something that on February 1st, 1982, as I sat in an empty church in Thibodeau, Louisiana, as I was a student at Nickel State University, having grown up in New Orleans uh, and living my life in my own manner, there was something on that Monday that brought me to that point of giving my life and giving uh, you know, myself 100% over to Jesus Christ. As he came in, in my ignorance, man, it revolutionized my life. I'm walking one way, the next thing you know, boom, I'm going the exact opposite way. I was a theater major. I made a choice at that point. I walked off the stage. I never acted in another production after three years of production after production. And for me, it was time to start acting like the person God created me to be. And so all of a sudden now, I'm figuring all this out. And as Peter says, prepare your minds for action. All of a sudden, what's that saying is that, you know what? I've got to make sure that my mind is lined up with this word. You know something? I've got to put my mind on things above. You know something? I am who he said I am. 
You know, this world will try to tell you who you think or who they think you are. Can, can, I, can I give you a little confession here this morning? I'm going to really trip you out just a little bit. I'm a preacher. I've been a preacher a long time. From that day, six months later, I started the Chi Alpha group at Nickel State University. I stayed there for four years after graduating from college. Uh, and then I've been here, like I said, since 87. I have thought about stealing. Thought about stealing. Wow, Eric, that's a good confession for a preacher on a Sunday morning. Well, let me explain. Let me explain. I grew up on the West Bank in New Orleans, grew up, as we like to call today, impoverished, <laughs> okay? Or, as we said, we were just poor, okay? We were just poor folks, okay? We were poor folks, but we, we, we didn't know we were poor. We, we enjoyed life. We, we never really went without a meal. Uh, it might have been a little thin. There might have been a little more water in the gumbo, but we never went without. You understand what I'm saying? But as a kid, you know, there were times where, boom, take a little something, steal a little something, and, and then you kind of justify it based on the background, Okay. High school, stole a few things here and there. Actually, in the ninth grade, went to jail. I've told that story before uh, for stealing. And, and so I've, I've thought about stealing recently. Now, here's the deal. I think about stealing because, one, I know what it's like to be impoverished, and I know what it's like to think about stealing stuff. So around Chi Alpha, we have to lock things up. We understand that. So when I think about stealing, I'm thinking about who else is coming to steal because I would do that if I wasn't born again. See what I'm saying? And so I, I, I think about that. And, and you know what? Every now and then, there, you know, I'm someplace and I'm going, man, I can't believe these people are leaving this land out. If I weren't born again, I would steal that. Now, Eric, does that mean you're a thief? No, no, I'm not a thief and I'm not going to let you put that on me. See, every thought that I have, I have to make that thought bow. I have to make that thought line up and submit itself to the word of God. See, I, I think about it, but I'm not going to meditate on it. I'm not going to allow it to stew. I'm not going to allow it to be justified. And I'm not going to grab my hand in uh, the kitty, so to speak, and pull something out and justify it. Are you tracking with me? Because now, because I've been born again, my mind is being renewed. My heart is being renewed. And anytime a thought comes, bam, I'm going to take and make that thought captive to the word of God. Now, Eric, why is that important? Well, it's important because of the battleground in which all of us are living in. See, there's some of you that, that you're allowing thoughts to all of a sudden become bigger than what they should be. And you're allowing them to get outside of the captivity of the, of the truth of, God, of the word of God. See, we live in a culture where, you know, there are people, honestly, there are people who sometimes grieve longer than what they should grieve. I'm, I'm just going to be straight. I, I know that. I understand depression. I understand grieving. I understand all of that. But there comes a point where, you know what? You got to take those thoughts and you got to make them captive. You know something? I live in a culture, and we live in a culture, where people are trying to identify who they are sexually. And instead of just understanding God created you this way, we live in a world that people are saying, well, maybe, maybe I'm not this. And they allow a thought to be planted. They start thinking about it. And then they got people around them encouraging them. And the next thing you know, boom, that's right. I'm not this way. I'm this way. Do you hear what I'm saying? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Do you know when he's talking about self-control? He's talking about two major things in, our, in, in, in the time frame in which he was writing. He was talking about excessive use of alcohol and sexual immorality. Now, of course, we don't have problems with either one of those. <laughs> Mardi Gras! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's think about this. Be self-controlled. Wait a minute. You're not an animal. You've been created in the image of God. We're different than animals. I do not have to do what my instincts want to do. See, if you're born again, let me just tell you this. You've entered into a battle. 
if you really are born again, you've entered into a battle. If you don't have a battle going on, you're not really born again. Let me just say it. Why? Well, because if you're really born again, then all of a sudden your spirit is trying to tell your flesh to shut up all the time. And there's a little battle going on. And to see, the thing is, oftentimes, some of us, we're, we're, not, we're not having the battle because either you've given up on something. Well, that's just the way I am. I always cuss. That's just, oh, excuse my French. <laughs> Dude, let me just say something. French is a beautiful language, and that ain't French. <laughs> the thing is, yes, that may be the way I, I, I am, or was, you see, that's the beauty. I've been born again. It's a little reboot. It's a little restart. Come on, baby. You know, <laughs> I, I get a reboot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I used to steal, but guess what? I don't anymore. Does it mean I don't ever think about it? No, no, I've, I've thought about it, but I'm going to take it. And boom. I'm gonna make it captive and I'm gonna live a self-controlled life. You know what? I'm going to think about what this life is all about. I'm going to put my, my heart and my mind on things above and beyond. You know, there's a day coming when Jesus Christ is coming back. And you know, I'm, I'm going to think about that. Why? Well, because that's going to be a motivator for me. Man, I was just reading the book of Revelation to where, you know, they were looking for someone who was worthy to open the seal and there was none found worthy. And John is crying and saying, there's no one worthy. And then someone said, no, here comes the lamb. And it's like, Come on, here comes the lamb. Anyway, I was blessed. So the thing is, I think about heaven. I think about heaven. The older I get, I'm thinking about heaven. But you know something? Heaven isn't something old people should be the only ones thinking about. I'm just going to say it because the reality is there's not a single one of us assured of any more time on this earth. And, and eternity has already begun. Eternity has already started. All we're doing is stepping over to another existence. And then that existence, you know, the person over here going, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God. They're going to step over it, and guess what their first response is going to be? Uh-oh. <laughs> Maybe I should have rethought that, you know? <laughs> There'll be that moment where, whoa, uh-oh. And it's going to be too late. See, here's my thing. I want to be ready for when we step over. Boom. I'm not going to meet death head on. I'm not going to meet death. I'm going to meet Jesus. See, that's what I'm assured of as a believer. Okay, so, so the thing is, I'm going to think about that. And you know what? As he begins to wrap all this up in verse 15, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. This was the mini sermon. The mini sermon is this. God is more concerned about your holiness than he is your happiness. And the whole goal of the Christian experience is for you and I to live holy before the Lord. Why? Well, because it's his stamp of going, look, I created them with a free will and I've given them a choice whether they're going to love and honor me in everything they say, everything they do, everything that they're about by choice, not because they have to, and they're going to choose to live a holy life. And you see, the thing is, when we choose to live a holy life, all of a sudden, what's going to happen is you're going to be more aware of the presence of God in your everyday life, number one. Number two, it's going to be a radiant, radiant message to a world that is lost and dying and literally walking in darkness, ready to crack hell wide open. I believe if there's ever a time the time is today that we understand the importance of living a holy life. See, everything I just said, your mind, self-control, where your thoughts are going, choosing to be obedient to the things of God, all that adds up to you and I living a holy life. There's no getting around it. I, I would love to say that there, there's something else you know, in the scripture we need to talk about. But man, I really feel compelled today as never before that there needs to be an awakening within the realm of the body of Christ. And we have to rediscover and have a heart for the things of God, which should ignite this realm of holiness to begin to rise up within us. I really do believe the time is now that believers need to not only say what they believe, but more importantly, 
live what they believe. When we start living this thing out, that's what holiness really is all about. The problem is we get a little complacent in areas. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but when I first gave my life to Christ, oh, dude, it was it was an about face. I had nobody tell me anything. Uh, I was drinking. I was, uh, you know, drugs, all this kind of stuff. Dude, I went on a 12-step program, but I went from step one to 12 in a matter of 20 minutes. Uh, I, I didn't know from Scripture that I, I shouldn't be drinking, but something inside of me told me I shouldn't. You know, I didn't know I was living this immoral life, that that, that was wrong. I didn't read it yet but something inside, boom. And so I made choices right off the bat. Every one of us can point to times, man, when we, when we had this acceleration of an experience with God. But then what happens? After a little bit, we become a little casual. And, and you know, what, what used to be hardcore, we kind of start loosening up on. See, the thing is, there's never a time to pull back. There's never a time to give up. There's only a time to, to, to keep moving, especially as we see the days closer and closer to his return. So in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So I'm here today to, to lay out a standard of how we should live our lives. We should live our lives being perfect, right? Now, let me just tell you this. I'm, I'm going to be straight with you here today. Um, this morning, absolute perfection absolute perfection. Then I pulled the cover off and, and, and lost it from there. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I woke up this morning, man, my first thoughts, it was absolute perfection. When I spilled that hot coffee on my hand, it was a little different story, okay? <laughs> a little different story. But, but, but the thing is, what should we be striving for? Well, we should be striving for perfection. Now, can we, can we actually reach perfection? Well, if you're bowling, you can, you can bowl a perfect game, am I right? You know, uh, if, if I'm, I'm doing other things, as a matter of fact, if I'm Mary Lou Retton and it's 1984 and I've got this, this, um, event where I've got to run really fast and I've got to jump and hit this thing and I got to twist and I got to land it, um, that could possibly be perfection, possibly, but you know how hard that is? As a matter of fact, if you remember the story in 1984, she had this last event, and if she would score a 10, which was perfect, she would win the gold medal for her and for her team and the whole bit. And boom, here's the little girl does this. It's not normal. It's not natural. But she does it. She lands it. Guess what she gets? A 10. It is perfection. Is perfection possible? Yes, in different events. Is perfection possible within the realm of our Christian life? You know something? I really do believe perfection is something we should strive for. See, here's the thing. Anybody wake up and go, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to sin one quarter of the time. <laughs> I'm going to love, I'm going to love the Lord this morning about half hearted. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be half hearted today. You know, I mean, think about it. I mean, when, when, when we wake up and we strive on each day, how many of you, when you take time to pray, and you spend time in the presence of the Lord by yourself. I don't know how the Lord speaks to you, but he speaks to me in video 3D format. Like, I'll close my eyes, I'll start praying, and I'm just taking time, and I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling like I had a pretty good day. You know, Lord, <laughs> I'm not like other men. No, <laughs> you know, I'll have that little moment. But but soon as I quiet down, all of a sudden, it's like, you know, the Lord's sitting there going, Hey, uh, Gabriel, run the tape. <laughs> oh wow I was rude to that lady oh man oh look at that I said the right thing but I said it the wrong way to my wife oh man uh, that wasn't even right either way that, that, that was wrong you know it's amazing what you'll see when, when, when he begins to roll the tape see the thing is though guess what that doesn't beat me down that motivates me I'm a little competitive. I want to win. Okay. I really, I really do. I don't know about you, but I, I want to win. And, and I would hope in some way, shape or form, his desire is not to beat you down. His desire is to motivate you. You know what? A mistake is nothing more than an opportunity to figure out what I did wrong and do it right the next time around. You know what? I, I'm, I'm going to say it a little different to my wife next time. Oh, oh guess what? When she asks for, I'm, I'm going to get up. I'm going to do it. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to see this as a ministry emptying the dishwasher. 
<laughs> There's an anointing, right? Hey, but I will tell you it, it, that that could be ministry. Am I right? I'm going to get up early. I'm going to go put, put fuel in, in her car. Ooh, ooh, man, it's raining. It's raining. <laughs> All the more reason to do it. Anyway, it's getting, getting convicting. But, <laughs> but the thing is, we should be striving. We should be striving for perfection. We should be striving to live a holy life. If you're here today and you feel like you've made it, let me tell you, you're number one in not making it. <laughs> when we feel like we've made it, then man, what's, what's the use in coming to church? What's the use in being together with the body of Christ? What's the use? No, no, no. We need each other. Why? Because we have not made it. There are none perfect among us, but guess what? We're all striving for that place. And you know what? You're going to help me get there. Guess what? My wife is going to help me get there. Her motivation, her encouraging, her, her encouraging. <laughs> that was just for the guys. Okay. That was just for the guys. You got to throw one out every now and then. That's going to encourage me. It's going to help me. It's going to motivate me. It's going to make me better. So how are we going to do it? How's he, how's he do it? How does God do it? How does he want to make us perfect? Well, number one, I really do believe through, through the word. Through the word. You know what? He talks about a husband presenting his wife before the Lord with the washing of the word, making her perfect before the Lord. The washing of the word. I think the word of God is powerful. I really do. I, I believe in the word of God. I believe everybody you know, needs to be reading this thing on a regular basis. Oh, I've read that story before. <laughs> you haven't read it this way. Keep reading. I'm, I'm telling you, it's like a diamond. I mean, every time I can read the same story, but it's like, wow, where'd that character come from? I've read that story how many times? I never noticed that guy. You know, I never noticed this. The word of God is powerful. And we should not be playing Bible roulette with it. Okay, meaning I'm just going to read whatever. I'm looking for a word today. You know, Judas hung himself. I mean, you know, come on. There's a word. <laughs> we should systematically be reading through the scripture on a regular basis. That should be a regular part of your routine. We live in a day and age where the word of God is available to us in every way, shape, and form. But yet we have it, but we're not utilizing it. It doesn't matter what's around us. It matters what's in us. And so on a regular basis, why do I need to read this? Because, because this is part of how God is going to make you perfect or holy. He's going to do it through the washing of the word. Man, read the thing on a regular basis. Two. I believe out of reverence for the Lord, out of reverence for the Lord. See, when you start reading the scripture, you'll start noticing these things called promises. And there's this incredible stuff that he has promised us. And you know what? That promise is predicated upon an action on our part oftentimes. And you know something? I, I can receive those promises when I act out of reverence for him. What does that mean? Well, that means, you know, if, if you knew that somebody of importance was coming to your home, out of reverence, you would probably try to straighten it up, right? Yeah. Out of reverence, you would try to clean it up and, you know, make it presentable and you're going to put your best foot forward and all that kind of stuff. Do you know that in everyday life, whether we know it or not, the Holy Spirit is there? When you make that choice of flipping that channel or, or popping on that link, the Holy Spirit is there. See, at some point, we've got to start making decisions out of reverence for the Lord. And you know what? When we start making those decisions based on the reverence of the Lord, that's something called maturity, and it's an incredible step toward living a holy life. See, we can put on airs, we can put on a lot of different things, but it's really who you are when nobody else is looking that, that is really telling us who you are as far as whether or not you're living out a holy life or not. And, and here in 2 Corinthians, he says, man, we should do it out of reverence, out of reverence, that there should be a holy fear of the Lord, that we make choices. Three, yes. discipline. And, you know, here in Hebrews, he's talking about the discipline that we receive through other believers. You know what? Because the Lord loves us, he disciplines us. Can I just say this? If you've never been disciplined, it's because you're just kind of out there in an orbit by yourself. 
See, can I just give you a little clue? Um, church, this is an event that we do on, on a Sunday morning. But the church is something that happens 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Meaning that we should have connections and relationships with other believers. And there should always be somebody in my life that is kind of like an Apostle Paul, somebody who's older than me in the faith. I need to seek out someone that will speak to me and challenge me even when I don't like what they've got to say. And then as a believer, I should have a Timothy, somebody who's younger in the faith that I am looking out for. See, the problem is we're all basically selfish. You know, we, we want good messages. We want stuff that's going to bless us. We like the worship music this way. We like all these kinds of things. But the nitty gritty of the Christian faith is guess what? Another born again believer looking you in the face and going, Hey, brother, you're doing great. You're, man, God has just done some incredible things in you. But man, you got to brush your teeth on a regular basis. I mean, you know, sometimes you need somebody who loves you enough to tell you the truth. Am I right? Now, everybody else sees it. Everybody else is walking around going, Hey, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Hey, yeah, how's the family? You know, I mean, you know, and, and nobody wants to say anything, but there's that one person that loves you enough to speak truth. Am I right? And we all need that one person. Who is that person for you? Who is that person that's going to look you in the face and go, hey, man, you shouldn't be doing that? Hey, man, you need, yeah, what, what, what's up with that? Can I just give you a, a, my experience? My experience is this. Anytime students get into any kind of sin, specifically uh, sexual immorality or, or drugs or any of that kind of stuff, the number one thing they do is, number one, pull themselves out of community, and then they reattach themselves to another community. And what that community is, it's a community that will tell them what they want to hear. Hey, oh, y'all are sleeping together, but, but y'all repent after? It's okay. Oh, and you'll have a Bible study after you have sex? It's okay. I mean, oh my goodness. You know something? We need people who are grounded and who understand the reality of the, of the Word of God. And they're going to love us enough to speak truth. You know what? You do not want a person who can't swim trying to pull you out when you're drowning. I want, I want, I want a good swimmer. I want somebody, and actually they can just throw me a rope, okay, and be on shore and pull me up. You understand what I'm saying? I just want to get up. The reality is discipline. The Lord loves us enough that he will discipline us through people, but are we putting ourselves in a position to be disciplined? And this, I really do believe that one of the key ways that he uh, makes us holy is by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. We, we as, as a church, we believe in an experience called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the Holy Spirit was poured out just so that we could, you know, trip some Baptist churches out. I don't, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> and for those who've been around a little bit, you understand what I just said. But, um, I, you know, I don't believe it. It, it was, it was to, you know, the Holy Spirit is there to, you know, for the spiritual elite. Can I just tell you something? All around the world, I don't care what denomination people are in other parts of the world, this experience as far as the baptism of the Holy Spirit is real and it's happening among every major denomination in the world outside of the U.S. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let me tell you something. In the early 1900s, there was kind of a revival of this teaching. It came through a guy by the name of William Seymour. William Seymour was a black man from Centerville, Louisiana, who ended up in a meeting and in a Bible college in Houston. He heard this teaching, embraced this teaching, and then he went to California and basically got kicked out of his own denomination and then started having meetings in a little house on a street called Azusa. It was at Azusa Street that all of a sudden a revival began to break loose and people from all the world were coming in and experiencing this filling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Again, the purpose isn't just God's looking to mess with us and, and, and make us weird. No, no, no. 
It is an actual gift that he's wanting to give you in order to help you to live a holy life. The key word is Holy Spirit now coming in overflowing within our hearts and within our lives. On the day of Pentecost, the believers there had no clue what was going to happen. The unfortunate thing is that you and I, we can see through Scripture what, what took place. And sometimes we let that trip us out. Oh, oh my goodness, i got to speak in tongues. No, no, you don't have to. You get to. <laughs> you know, It's the fact that God wants to use the most unruly part of your body. He wants to use it to glorify Him. He wants to use that to give you a little something. Man, you're going to get a little prayer language that when you pray in the Spirit, you are praying according to the will of God. And you know what? When you don't know how to pray and you've gone as far as you... 